the loyalty of all the other gang members is something that's quite remarkable. They did not want to dissociate themselves with the craze and that way appear unloyal because this was the structure, this was the society. We're loyal to the culture. We're loyal to the friends that we've always known, the people we drink with, the people we eat with, the people we piss and shit with. You understand? Not the craze. I put them before my own family. You know, Chris just had to go along with it, whether he likes it or not. That was a chosen but I went down that road. And there was no going back. So they didn't have to go down. They could have done what, they, what Albert done and what I done. So they thought, well, the twins will get us off of this. They've got good lawyers, good barristers, plenty of money about. Plenty of money about for them. God knows what they paid. The rest of them had to get legal aid. Did your council ever suggest that diminish responsibility? Uh, they done, done it indirectly. The message did come down the line um, if I wanted to um, dim, diminish responsibility. Well, of course, it would have been um, guilt, guilt way to go with it first and deal with it afterwards. Mm. And you didn't want that? No. Mm. Why? Because there was nothing there. Nothing, they just wanted me guilty. Mm. And morally, it, 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 for me, it wasn't right morally. Um, I couldn't, couldn't go against my own brother, so that was it. So you think that if you'd have taken their uh, offer, they then would have wanted you to damage Ronnie's case? I'm sure that would, be, would have been the case, yeah. Mm. Now, the Minister of Responsibility does not apply to someone who says, I never did it. It's as, uh, as one would say, there's an alibi and, uh, and self-defence. You can't have both. If he said, yes, I did it, then we look into what the state of his mind was at the time. But he always denied he did any of the offences. Mr Foreman, I want you to ask me, simply by saying yes or no, have you all reached a verdict in the case of Ronald Cray in, in, in the first indictment? Yes. Have you reached a, a second indictment? Yes. And then uh, went back to say, and then how do you find Roger? And he said guilty. And then he said guilty. And I was looking down like this, and I couldn't look up. My eyes were full of tears. It, it was a, a bit of a... You know, all the work that we'd done was justified. Ronnie Cray, 30 years. Ian Barry, 20 years. Ronnie Bender, 20 years. Reggie Cray, 30 years. Charles Cray, 10 years. Tony Barry, acquitted being under duress. Chris Lambriano, 15 years. Freddie Foreman, 10 years. Tony Lambriano, 15 years. Connie Whitehead, 7 years. Well, the judge was uh, so carried away by the duty he felt he had to put down the whole tribe, that he dished out to the lesser members as well. I never thought that Milford would swing with such violence. I wasn't surprised at the sentences in any way. A gang of people that had ruled the East End of London by a regime of terror and fear, had killed people coldly, analytically, motivelessly, uh, in full view of, of other people, simply because they wanted to exercise their authority as gang leaders. How old are you now? 66. And how long have you been in prison? Just over 33 years. 33 years? Um. So you've spent literally half your life in prison. Reggie would have been in a place like this. This is a a cell is not wide and it's not long and you never felt the cold until you've been in somewhere like this. It might have had a few photographs and pictures on the wall, a bed there, maybe even an out of bed cover and a radio and that would have been his total existence. Day to day, that's how you live it. That's how you live it. You survive it, you come out of it. But you, don't, you can never forget it. I've seen a man killed over a small transistor radio. 
man walked by me and said, good morning, Chris, and walked in a cell and murdered a man with a homemade knife in cold blood over a small transistor radio. What price life? I got a certain amount of trouble there, and I, over the years I've done a certain amount of cons, inmates, for different reasons, the side of salt on the record. I've done about six screws. He had his fights with the screws when they first went away. He tried to he tried to kill himself. He no one said about that, but he tried to kill himself because he was sick of the life he had in there. Yeah, I can't be missed in Long Larm Prison uh, on, on two occasions, one, one twice in Parkhurst. I think it was a, a de de depression at the time. Um, I think I was on some medication and it's side effects, I believe they've done it, side effects of the medication. Mm, Valium. Mm. I don't think he meant to top himself. I think it was a cry, a terrible cry. Uh, help me. A man who does um, more than 10 years is changed for the worse, forever, I believe. An ordinary man of ordinary capacity, I think, is ruined by it. You've got to have some spark of genius or maybe a political ideal. Everyone sees it more than reasonable if I'd have been out 15 years ago. At least, uh, the most, you see. But um, why I never, um, I, I, I can't explain. If Reggie Cray had expressed uh, complete remorse some years ago when he's 30 years old, then the probability is that he would have been allowed out. I think it was everything the books and the films and everything that had gone around. And I do believe that when they sentenced Reg and Ron, and they sent them to prison, and they locked the doors, and they believed that they had well and truly thrown away the key, then at the next step would simply be obscurity. And in fact, the, the exact opposite happened. And the media interest grew, and the public fascination grew. And the Home Office found itself 27 years down the road with two men who, who had become incredibly famous. The idea of somebody who's in prison becoming the subject matter of a film is deeply unpopular. I think it's felt that somehow, even if it isn't financially, they will benefit. And benefit by the fame, if that is a benefit, by the notoriety. The last thing that anybody in prison needs is a high profile. And they were, to a certain extent, author of their own misfortunes. So I got a certain amount of writing ability, which I think, um, my mum was passed down to me. She wasn't a writer herself, um, she's got great common sense in there, but, um, I, she, I seem to get these inspirational flashes and I think it's passed down from my mother. I can't see it being coming from anyone else. Among his writings were certain revelations that were not popular with other members of the firm, who were still serving long prison sentences. Four or five years later, he admits it. I done that for you. What good was that to me or any of the other defendants, any of us? Nothing. Yeah, I was just a loser of it. Big sick about it. There I am sitting to Nick for something that he couldn't admit before, and a couple of years later he comes out of it. Did we all go down for him to write a book? Ronnie Craig wanted a traditional East End funeral, and his family made sure his wishes were respected down to the last detail. Among the masses of flowers was a tribute from Reggie which read, To the other half of me. And then came the message from Reg. My brother Ron is now free and at peace. Ron had great humour, a vicious temper, was kind and generous. He did it all his way, but above all he was a man. And that's how I'll always remember my twin brother, Ron. God bless, Reg Cray. Yeah, I used to get um, um, free warnings type of thing. If I felt that he's, um, he, he wasn't right in himself, I'll get a kind of instinct about it. And I knew he was always right. We had a form of tele uh, communication. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, I still got it, in fact. Um, let me back area. It feels very burning in a nice way. A nice, warm, glowing feeling. 
And I think that's wrong as presents. I've not had it since I was in Maidstone. Oh, it's been back the last few days. Do you think you were dominated by Ronnie? Well, I suppose it's possibly. Uh, I allowed him to dominate me to a um, point. I think it's some silly thing I did me that I'm um, just let, the, let, let, let there be peace. You see? Uh, yeah. I don't doubt that there was a big space in, in Reggie's life and, and a terrible emptiness. And I can't say I went in and, and filled that, because you can't, you can't replace someone else, you can't take the place of them, but you can just help to ease, ease that pain and to give someone some love. And if they can give you some love back as well, then you have achieved something. I think love's influence is really great on me. Um, you know, it's, it's, she's got a great influence on me. Without being stern, without, um, without any influence coming across, it's there. You know, I would never be dominated by any woman or anyone else. But um, she's got a great influence on me, and we get on well together. Rush proposed to me over the phone, I might have. And so I asked him if he was down on one knee, and he said he definitely was. <laughs> well, I just wish I'd have met Rob about 20 years earlier, eh? I don't think I'd have had any problems then, eh? I think everything would have worked out OK. They originally refused to let us have any photos taken of our wedding at all, and it took a lot of persuasion before they finally agreed but only on the condition that a prison officer took the photographs and that they maintained that they held on to the negatives afterwards. About a month after the wedding, they took us into a small room when I was on a visit. They had the photographs laid out on a table, 60, 70 photos, and they told us we could choose 10 of those pictures. It was 15 months before I finally got the set of 10 pictures. All these photographs are obviously crown copyrighted. We weren't allowed to use them. The ten I received, I wasn't allowed to reproduce in any way. They belonged to the crown. That's why. They're crown copyright, aren't they? That's what we were told. Yeah. yeah. Pretty we couldn't do anything with it, isn't it? Eh? I don't think I'd have married Raj if I'd believed that he would... that he was never coming out of prison because I think it would have been a, a meaningless gesture. And when I did marry him, it was firstly a commitment to him to say I love you, but secondly to say I believe in you and I believe that one day you are coming out of prison. And yes, you, you, you hope that it will help, that he will be coming out to a stable home, a stable place to live, and, and all those factors will help in the parole board's decision. You used to train a lot in the prison. Did you stop that regime as a result of feeling ill? Yes, I stopped, stopped training hard. Um, when I got to Whalen, um, I still used to go to the gym, but um, I lost the incentive I had, um, not because I didn't want to do it, but because of the stomach problems. So I still trained on that period of three years, but um, it started to de decrease then. I still think it's the best thing to do in, in prison. I can't call, keep talking about prison, can I? <laughs> Reg was ill for a number of years, probably starting at Maidstone, continuing at Wayland, getting progressively worse through his three years at Wayland until the final year when he was in almost continual pain and discomfort. Over that period of years, did you feel you had something seriously wrong with I you? I definitely did, and I told him this. I definitely did. I knew there was something seriously wrong. It couldn't be otherwise. I was going to the toilet so many times a day. It was um, physically impossible, almost. And when I told him this, I didn't seem to... It didn't have any bearing on it. I said to him, you don't look too clever. But I shouldn't have said that to him. 
I should have said, oh, you're looking all right. You know what I mean? But you don't, you don't think. You just say what's on your mind. And he didn't look clever at all. He looked very ill. And he was. He had cancer. Do you feel that death is the only way they would release you? Do you feel they wanted to keep you in there forever? I think the way I was released wasn't satisfactory to him, but it's helped to resolve a very bad embarrassment on their part. So that's the best arm. Um, they got a good deal with it. They got a good deal. They found a way out, but I still feel in front of them. It was a huge event for him to get his freedom. He'd waited 32 years for that. And it, he was tremendously happy, he was tremendously elated. But at the same time, the, the downside for it was that it was almost like a confirmation of the fact that he was dying. You don't see it at the time. Because I was a wife and a young child. And I was a son born when I was on remand. I was never to see him until he was 16 years of age when I come out. I had a daughter who was nearly six and was 22, nearly 23 when I come out of the nick. The marriage was over. My father became an old man, never knowing really what, 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 what had happened. You know, and the, the tragedy and heartache they left for all our families. What good came out? Where was the glamour and all that? There was no glamorous about it. We'd lost everything, really. We'd given everything up for them. Our future, our lives. Our club got ruined um, after the trial. Within a matter of about months, they re the police revoked the licence and put us out of business. It's like the association, the smear did rub, it rubbed off on us. You understand? 1970, that was it. It was all over. It's really a Cockney tragedy. It's a very, very sad, god-awful story. The idea of it actually encouraging anyone, or anyone wanted to be like the craze, is another part of the sadness, because it's something sad in our own society, which makes heroes of people like this. What better message can you put out to the, to the would-be gangsters of, of today, or are the criminals coming up? There's, these are the heroes you look up to, to the youth, and say, well, the, what, look what happened to them, the three of them have all died in prison. I find it hard to believe they're all gone, sitting here today. But they, it seems to me that that's the way it had to be, one or the other. It was a warning that if you do this or you do that, this is what could happen to you. And I think that was, that was the message left here over the years. Prison life is a waste of time. Um, I get letters from all over the country. These kids write to me and um, I advise them. It's very difficult when kids got nothing to do with um, and they got no money um, and they've got all kinds of social problems there. So it's, it's easier to say than it is done. But speaking speaking from my heart to them, I'd like to see them stay in prison. But whether they can do so, I don't know. Some will make it and some won't. videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.